Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. I'm ready. YouTube, I'm sorry. I will not make the mistake again. Um, I am reformed, and I'm going to be only doing uh, history stuff. That is purely not copyright striked. No copyright claim. I'm a good boy. I promise. I'm not being forced to say this. Let's go. I'd recommend watching the previous many parts here, but that's up to you. Ask someone if you can copy their notes. Uh, if you are not ready to learn, there is the door. Homek is down the hall. You are in the wrong class. Make me a strudel. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Chapter 7. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. True. Our story, the story of modern Turkey, begins here on the beach in the Dardanelles, in a place called Gallipoli. And to fully understand and appreciate, we need to go back to be introduced to the man who would make and shape modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. He was born as Mustafa in 1881 in Salonika, which is today's Thessaloniki in modern-day Greece. It might seem weird to you, but in the Ottoman Empire, commoners did not have last names, only the royal family did. Growing up in Ottoman Greece as a- Let me just open the window here. did not have last names, only the royal family did. Growing up in Ottoman Greece as a Turk would impact his views in later life. The experience of being part of a minority in a majority culture, but also in that he was exposed to the nationalism and ideas of the Greeks around him at the time. Not just if Greece should be an independent state or not, but whether it should be a Hellenic kingdom or a Hellenic republic. In school he would excel at maths and prove to be a very intelligent kid, resulting in his teacher giving him his second name, Kemal, from the Arabic word for excellence. Okay. After school he would enroll in an Ottoman military academy in Northern Macedonia and later in the Ottoman military staff college in Istanbul, pursuing a career as an army officer. It was through his path through the military institutions of the empire that he met and joined the various revolutionary movements around the Young Turks. He himself also got the chance to travel abroad and also formed revolutionary organizations. Question, guys. Question. So, um, with the Ottoman Empire at this time, you know, they're, they're going to be dragged into, you know, I'm sure there are some conflicts in the Balkan areas and they're kind of, you know, his centuries of fighting the Russians or the um, Austrians or, or, or whatnot, do, do, it, it, are, are, they, are they often fighting throughout those centuries w on their southern and west and eastern flanks, like in, mo in like the modern-day Iran area or, or Saudi Arabia area? I think they control most of the, but are they fighting anyone else outside of the European theater? Like, are there big battles with other, with like Asian, Middle Eastern uh, war, like battles with people around there? Such as in Damascus, with the chance to travel abroad and also formed revolutionary organizations such as in Damascus, with the intention of reforming the empire. He was in many ways a rebel. He smoked a lot and even drank a lot of alcohol, which was highly forbidden in the empire. He read illegal literature, discussed with his comrades how the empire should be reformed, and at one point even landed in jail for his activities. But there were big differences between him and the other mostly young Turk officers. Most importantly, he was not a young Turk. Neither did he believe in their ideas and plans. The young Turks mainly looked for their inspiration on how to reform the empire to the German empire and to German nationalism as something to copy. The strict militaristic state hierarchy of what was basically a military dictatorship. Just like uh, the Japanese, right? They also, around the same time, were... Wait, what time is this? Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Uh, date of birth, 1881. So, 
Meiji Restoration, right? So it's interesting how both the the Ottomans and the Japanese, who are looking to transform into more modern military powers, both look to Prussia and Germany. Was in their opinion the only way to save the Ottoman Empire. Mustafa Kemal, however, disagreed. He was more interested Bless in what you. he had seen Bless in me. France, Excuse in particular. Me a military dictatorship was in their opinion the only way to save the Ottoman Empire. Mustafa Kemal, however, disagreed. He was more interested in what he had seen in France, in particular the French Republic. He saw the pluralistic political system of the French Republic and its desire for progress and advancement in society and the sciences as a better model to copy. He learned to read and speak French, and as such, while the Young Turks read the translations of Prussian militarists, Mustafa Kemal preferred reading the works of French revolutionary and Enlightenment philosophers. In particular, his favorite one, Auguste Comte, a positivist who strictly rejected all forms of metaphysical thought, advocated for the advancement of society in thinking and actions reasoned and based on scientific facts. And the researcher is an, an, is an objective analyst of the external world. The end product of the research are law-like generalizations. One should make detached interpretations of data that was collected in an objective manner. The researcher should be independent of the subject of the research. Observations can be quantified, which permits statistical analysis. Agreed. And research, and in particular, advocated for mankind to liberate itself by abandoning all forms of religious ballast and superstition. Generally, in the history of the last 200 years, Comte's writing had more of an impact than most are even aware of. They are basically the foundation of modern French secularism known as laïcité, and you will find one of his quotes about achieving order and progress, at least partially, on the flag of the Brazilian Republic, whose founders were readers and admirers of Comte. But most significant for our story, they shaped the political thinking of the young officer cadet Mustafa Kemal. He believed the young Turks didn't go far enough, that they still clung on to old and outdated traditions, that their thinking was still by and large backward, that the German Empire they modeled themselves after was also backward, and that only radical social and state reforms modeled after European republics such as France would be the solution. You might have even heard or read some of his quotes from this era. There is only one civilization, the European civilization. There is no second civilization. Civilization is the European civilization. And it must be established here with all of its thorns and roses. And there was a second large point of this agreement between Mustafa Kemal and the Young Turks. And that disagreement was probably the biggest one, one with which Mustafa Kemal was also largely ahead of his time. He didn't believe that the empire should continue. He believed that the age of... Perfect, so that's what I mean. Like, during... Like, it's, it's history, you know, from... You know, with the sieges of Vienna to World War I. Um, did they have any conflicts with non-European powers and non-Russian powers? Like, did they ever fight, like, big battles? Some, I, I'd assume this area of the, of the Arabian Peninsula that they don't control is very arid, desert-like, uh, with some scattered nomadic, or scattered tribes that really can't put up a fight anyway. And I'm sure, you know, this land wasn't even worth conquering. And I'm wondering if they ever had confrontations. So who controlled uh, Persia at the time? Who controlled Iran at the time of uh, the Ottoman Empire? that the age of empires and colonialism was coming to an end. He also rejected ideas like Enver Pasha's Turanism, the idea of a pan-Turkish empire stretching from China to the Balkans as fantasies and delusions. Instead, he advocated for a small Turkish solution. The empire should disband and it should give up rule of the Arabs and the peoples of the Balkans. He also believed that empire held nations back, that for the Ottomans being tied into the Islamic world, in particular the Arab world, tied the Turks into religious-based political and social backwardness. Therefore, Turkey should give up into religion. Behead adulterers, unbelievers, and witches. Just based political and social backwardness. Therefore, Turkey should give up the idea of being the leaders of the Islamic world, reject all cultural influence. Can I say something about Islam, uh, which... It can't be controversial because I think it's the truth. And I guess that's, that can't, I'm saying it anyway. 
Um, I think that Islam, out of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the three Abrahamic religions, um, you can say a lot of bad things and good things about all three religions, but it is very clear that in today's day and age, Islam is the only, is the most infant of the three Abrahamic religions, and it still has so many followers who are still stuck with a lot of justice and political ideologies that Christianity went through many centuries ago. And so I'm not saying Islam is uniquely brutal and barbaric in a lot of its practices, but I think the brutality and barbarism in religion is still more prevalent in on earth today in Islam than it is in the other two major Abrahamic religions. I don't think that's controversial. Influences from there draw borders around the smaller, more compact, and mostly ethnically and lingually unison Turkish homeland instead of seeking deeper ties into Arabia. I have to go back, I forget. Or Turkey right. should give up the idea of being the leaders of the Islamic world, reject all cultural influences from there, draw borders around the smaller, more compact, and mostly ethnically and lingually unison Turkish homeland instead of seeking deeper ties into Arabia and Iran, and to build new bridges into Europe and North America and rebuild itself as a modern Turkish nation-state. By the time of the Young Turk coup, Mustafa Kemal had risen to the rank of colonel, and by the entry of the First World War was one of the most experienced military leaders of the Ottoman army, with combat experience in the war with Italy and the Second Balkan War. But because of his beliefs, he was kept away from any political power or even any significant military post. His relationship with the Young Turk government was strenuous at best, but eventually he was given a post commanding a division in Gallipoli, and it was there where he proved his worth. Unlike many of his young Turk contemporaries. Wait, why is he unmustached? That would be me because I, I I don't think I can grow one. Actually, mine would be like this guy's up here. Like it wouldn't be full and chunky like his or his or his. It'd be like a little guy. Turk contemporaries. He didn't just dress like a soldier, but actually was one. He had a better understanding. I gotta shut up. A division in Gallipoli, and it was there where he proved his worth. Unlike many of his young Turk contemporaries, he didn't just dress like a soldier, but actually was one. He had a better understanding of modern warfare and the defensive tactics of trench warfare. When the British sent an army of Australian and New Zealand troops to take the Dardanelles and Istanbul with the intention of knocking the Ottomans out of the war, he correctly anticipated where the attacks would take place to then organize and command a successful defense and what would be the first Ottoman victory of the war. The victory at Gallipoli changed his prospects as the German allies but also the young Turks had to recognize his potential but far more am I thinking of something else wasn't the victory at Gallipoli largely due to mines inside of the Dardanelles or am I thinking of something else I think I'm thinking of something else never forget what I said I don't want to take away from this guy be the first Ottoman victory of the war. The victory at Gallipoli changed his prospects as the German allies, but also the Young Turks, had to recognize his potential. But far more important for later years, the fact that he was fighting in Gallipoli kept him clear of any involvement in the Armenian genocide that was taking place at the same time. He was promoted to general in 1916 and given command of part of the army in the Caucasus where the Russians had recently launched an invasion of Anatolia. Under his command, the Russians were defeated at Bitlis, halting any further Russian advances. This victory made it abundantly clear that Gallipoli had not been a fluke and that it was one of the most- Question guys, I'm gonna go back five seconds. Why is it that countries like Japan and Turkey um, are so afraid to acknowledge an atrocity they committed, whether it's the Armenian genocide for the latter or the, um, you know, rape of Nanking and many things around the Pacific Island area and in China for the former, for Japan. And it's like, you know, we have horrific things in our past, Manifest Destiny pretty much wiping out an entire race of people, um, slavery, centuries and centuries of just treating people like literal cattle and pretty much just as bad as genocide right i would say slavery maybe the worst thing you can possibly do is genocide but i think slavery 
is right above that because, okay, you're not being slaughtered, but you're being treated as cattle and your kids as cattle forever. It, it wasn't even like serfdom, I don't think, where like these were people who were lower. You know, they, America has done some terrible things and so have many other countries, but I think acknowledging them shows that, that like you're, you're not blind and, and, and hopefully can have a, uh, barrier against doing anything like it again and so i for something that is so obviously true undeniable like what would happen in world war ii with china by japan how they won't like don't they still not today really recognize it or the armenian genocide for turkey i, I think it would benefit your image if you recognized it this victory made it abundantly clear that Gallipoli had not been a fluke and that he was one of the most competent commanders in the Ottoman army, for which, by 1917, he was put in charge of Ottoman forces in the Levant facing the British and the Arab revolt. But there were no victories to be found there. After years of incompetent leadership under Jamal Pasha and his attempts to terrorize the Arabs into obedience, the Ottomans had all but lost control over Arabia. Jerusalem fell to the British, as did Basra and Baghdad, and the Arabs were in full revolt in the remaining lands. By 1918, the Arab revolt had their biggest victory when they took Damascus and started marching on Aleppo. Faced with what would have been certain defeat, Mustafa Kemal decided to instead save his army and organized a retreat back into Anatolia. It was at this point, literally in the same week that Mustafa Kemal retreated his army into Anatolia in fact, that the Sultan, Mehmet VI, reached out to the Allied powers for peace and had an army. Reached out to the Allied powers for peace. Mehmed is one of those names like, um, forget which one. Just such a cool sounding name. Mehmed. Mehmed. I love that that the Sultan, Mehmet VI, reached out to the Allied powers for peace and had an armistice signed. The free young Turk Pashas, who had dragged the Ottoman Empire into this catastrophe in the first beard. place, as well as conducted the mm -hmm. Armenian Genocide, all fled abroad to escape being held accountable. Which in the end... To escape being held accountable. Which one of you in the comments can grow a beard like that? Let me know so I can be jealous. Holy moly. I heard what was said. And so didn't... I gotta stop joking around, I'm sorry. For, ser for real, I'm learning. Stop. Honor, you idiot. ...the Ottoman Empire into this catastrophe in the first place, as well as conducted the Armenian Genocide, all fled abroad to escape being held accountable. Which in the end didn't help them much. Talat Pasha was shot dead by an Armenian in Berlin in 1921. Enver Pasha was killed by an Armenian Red Army officer in the Caucasus in 1922. Jamal Pasha was killed in Georgia in 1922 by a group of free Armenians. And many other senior Young Turk figures involved in the Armenian Genocide who had fled abroad were killed by Armenians. It is also often forgotten today that in the aftermath of the war- Interesting. Wasn't that sort of exactly what was done by a lot of Israelis after uh, after World War II ended, like a lot of I know a lot of uh, ex Nazis or Nazis after the war like fled to South America, and so they started like tracking them down. Legal action was taken against many of the Ottoman officials who had partaken. Sorry, continue. Ottoman officials who had partaken in the Armenian Genocide in the defeated Ottoman Empire. This was demanded by the Allies and also endorsed by Mustafa Kemal, who wrote, It is our main wish that the rule of law be applied impartially, and that complete justice begins. Since the responsibility in our country is equally shared by young and old, the punishment should not only remain on paper, thereby remaining only propaganda which can lead to many unnecessary discussions but should be carried out since this would successfully impress the foreign element the court martials set up by the istanbul and ankara governments were however lackluster designed in a way that cabinet members could influence outcomes and sentencing and many of those involved managed to escape punishment by 1920, in the Paris suburb of Sèvres, Sultan Mehmet VI was made to sign the Treaty of Sèvres, a peace treaty even harsher than the Treaty of Versailles was on the Germans. The Ottoman Empire's lands in Arabia were to be divided up between the British and the French. Eastern Anatolia would be divided up amongst the newly formed Armenian Republic and the new Kurdish state. Southern Anatolia would be given to the French. East the Kurds. I've, I've heard Kurds a few times in, in kind of recent politics history 
And so, okay. The an Armenian Republic and the new Kurdish state. Southern Anatolia would be okay. given to the French. Eastern Anatolia divided amongst the Italians and Greeks. The Dardanelles and Istanbul would become a formerly international zone, however, under British occupation, so basically part of the British Empire. The Turks would be restricted to a small remaining rump state, Northern Anatolia, which was 15% of what the empire was before the war, and under a de facto colonial supervision. Adding to that were crippling reparations, it became abundantly clear that the Turks were to have their lands divided up as... It seems like the big difference between, you know, Germany and, and Turkey here, or the Ottoman Empire in Germany, is, is that... The Ottoman Empire was a much more fractured, full of, of inhabitants who were probably not too happy with the Turks and ripe for a, a sort of, you know, the Lawrence of Arabia story uh, type overthrow. Call it. And so the drastic reduction of the Ottoman Empire compared to what the Germans felt after the Treaty of Versailles makes sense. Knees to the victors. This treaty was unacceptable to Mustafa Kemal, who in mid-1919 was tasked with reorganizing the Ottoman army to crush any resistance against the treaty and the Sultan in the remaining rump state. Instead, he assembled a congress and from the small town of Ankara declared independence from the Sultan's government and proclaimed to resist the foreign occupation of Anatolia, beginning the Turkish War of Independence. That war, from the onset, seemed absolutely hopeless. The Turks were on their own and pretty much surrounded. The Greeks used this crisis to invade Anatolia in an attempt to build a greater Greece. The Armenians also invaded in an attempt to take the lands inhabited by Armenians before the genocide. The French army occupied vast parts of southern Anatolia, intent on dismantling Ottoman state and cultural structures. A large British fleet was anchored in Istanbul, and the Kurds by now were eager to build their own promised state. But a series of events at the beginning of this conflict pushed things into Mustafa Kemal's Favor. The British found oil in the Kurdish homelands of northern Mesopotamia, which led to them betraying the Kurds. Instead of giving them their own homeland, they clustered them into the new colonial administration of Iraq under Arab overlords. The remaining Kurds in Anatolia consequently sided with Mustafa Kemal, who promised them equality under Turkish rule and the resurrection of the Caliphate. Things looked far tougher in the east, as the Turks seemed to be in for a long protracted war with the Armenians. However, in 1920, out of the blue, the Soviet Union invaded Armenia and annexed it. With that, there were no more threats from the east. To the south, the French got bogged down in the guerrilla war with the local Turkish population and in early 1920 were defeated by the Turkish National Army under Mustafa Kemal's command, leaving wow. them with no other choice but to retreat back into French-occupied Syria. By far the biggest threat were the Greeks, who seized control of Anatolian lands that were actually promised to the Italians and marched into central Anatolia with one victory after another. The Greeks got close to taking Ankara but were halted and pushed back by 1921 under Mustafa Kemal's command. The war ended in 1922 with the Greeks retreating and the burning of the Greek city of Smyrna, which would later be rebuilt and renamed to Izmir. The end of the war with the Greeks pretty much solidified a Turkish victory, and the British, rather than fight, decided to abandon Istanbul and make peace with the Turks. This victory was a triumph that would cement Mustafa wow. Kemal as a national hero even before he had established his state. There are only five countries in the world that avoided being colonized. Most Ethiopia, then North Korea, Iran, Japan. Huh? ...established his state. There are only five countries in the world that avoided being colonized. Most through concessions and alliance... There are only five countries in the world that okay. avoided being colonized. Most through concessions and alliances with other empires, or by becoming colonial empires themselves. Turkey is unique amongst them, in that under Mustafa Kemal's leadership, it is the only one which managed to avoid colonization by fighting those who sought to colonize it, and more importantly, doing so on its own and outnumbered. It made Mustafa Kemal the savior of the nation and the revered leader and anti-colonial hero, even outside of Turkey, where many leaders in Arabia, Iran, and Pakistan would seek to copy him in the future. I, I hope I, I don't know enough about this guy. Um, I forget his name. But from the little I learned in the uh, Suez Crisis, he seems to be um, pretty uh, admirable, I'd say. I hope I, I don't... I hope I, there isn't something about him I don't know about. 
This war, however, also significantly changed the social makeup of Anatolia. There used to be a Greek population of up to 2 million people in Anatolia before the First World War, and with the burning of Izmir, the last big Greek population center disappeared. You can today still travel throughout the coastlines of Anatolia and you will find empty Greek towns and villages whose population packed and fled between 1914 and 1922. In the peace agreement, the League of Nations ordered a population exchange. One and a half million Greeks were to leave Turkey and head for Greece, while a million Turks were to leave Greece and head for Turkey. It is important to note that today this would be considered to be ethnic cleansing, but at the time it was seen as a legitimate policy measure to guarantee peace. But, as we would see later, it didn't. What it did, however, do was change- So you're telling me that going in and killing everyone and a organized swap between populations are both considered ethnic cleansing? Just without the genocide? So, okay. Anatolia, which for millennia had been a place of multiple cultures and faiths. The Christian population was reduced to a mere 2%, and the Anatolia Mustafa Kemal inherited was a by and large ethnically and religiously monomorphic society of Sunni Muslim Turks. Thousands of these Turks watched in late 1923 as the last British ships and troops left Istanbul. They all still wore the traditional Islamic headdress for men. Yeah, those hats are so iconic. Men called the Fez. Most of them probably had no idea that they were witnessing the dawn of a new age and the radical break with the past, unprecedented not just for Turkey, but in all of human history. On the 29th of October, 1923, the Turkish Republic was declared after the Sultanate had been abolished in the previous year. The only thing that this republic would keep from the past was the flag. Next part. Chapter 8. Let's finish it up, boys. Helveride, the year zero. The politician who needs help of religion to govern is nothing but an idiot. For more than 500 years, the rules and theories of ancient Arabic sheiks, Muhammad, and the absurd interpretations by generations of filthy and ignorant clergy in Turkey dictated all civil and criminal law. They dictated the state from the constitution, the smallest of activities and gestures of citizens, their diet, the hours of rest and labor, the choice of clothing, the curriculum in schools, our manners and habits, and even our most intimate thoughts. Islam is a rotting corpse that is poisoning all of our lives. Interesting. So, do you think this is a fair comparison? Do you think that he's sort of a, um, what's his name? Martin Luther type character, too, in that he's recognizing a lot of the crazy, um, all the kind of crazy rituals and, and, you know, Pope, all the things that go along with Christianity and being Christian, but with all that, with the, not all that stuff, it, would this be a, a similar, is this kind of a comparison? Like Protestantism leaving Catholicism and, you know, Mustafa Kemal, Ataturk, seeing Islam as a similar thing? There are many different nations, but there is only one civilization. A prerequisite for the progress within a nation is to be a part of that civilization. That's exactly what the Japanese seem to have thought in the uh, late 1800s. There are no differences between the Orient and the Occident. There is only a difference between backwardsness and maternity. The fez was a traditional Islamic headdress worn by men across the Islamic world. It originated in North Africa, and throughout the 17th and 18th century, it became increasingly widespread throughout the Islamic world. From Indonesia to Morocco, devout Muslim men would wear it, just as devout Muslim women would wear the veil. It became the official headgear of the Ottoman army uniform, and even non-Muslims who resided within the Ottoman Empire, and Muslims who lived outside of the Ottoman Empire, would wear it. It signified loyalty to the caliph. 
the Islamic social order, the Ummah, and the Caliph's authority over the Islamic world. You can see the fears on the heads of the cheering crowds as the Turkish Republic is founded in 1923. At that time, 80% of that republic's population lived in the countryside. 90% could neither read nor write. Ideas such as nationalism, 90%. Republicanism, liberalism, progress, modernity, science, or secularism were something most people had never even heard of. A national identity didn't exist, and most group identities were restricted to clans, religious groups, and family structures within... Question. Do you guys think that languages prior to writing were almost never a solid thing? Because if you don't have writing then all of the tradition of language, of, of, of speaking, of, of what, what sounds out of your mouth mean what things, they change over time, even with or oratory tradition. J just look at America and, and the UK, or, or South Africa, the UK, or whatever. I'm, I'm sure if you're Spanish from Spain, talking to someone from Chile or Mexico or Cuba, I I'm sure that there's a slight accent difference. And so before writing, I'm sure that like th there was never really a language that survived recognizably for more than a few centuries, right? Rural villages. This was not a population that could carry and advance a revolution, especially since they wouldn't even understand what a revolution was or what they were doing it for, which consequently would shape what Ataturk's revolution would be, one dictated from the top to bottom, and not the other way around as revolutions usually go. This in return would leave behind a legacy of governance enforced autocratically from top to bottom, no matter what the wider rabble may think of it. Within a period of 14 years, the world of the average Turk was turned completely on its head. On the 3rd of March 1924, Mustafa Kemal formally abolished the Caliphate. This might seem like nothing to you from an outsider's perspective, but remember, the Sultan and the Caliph were two separate institutions. The Sultanate had been abolished two years before with the founding of the Republic, but the Caliphate had still existed. There were many sultans throughout the Islamic world throughout its history, but there could only ever be one caliph. The caliph was not a pope of the Islamic world, but considered to be the spiritual descendant of Muhammad and to represent his authority as a religious authority to all Muslims. The caliphate had existed since Islam itself existed. The title had gone from the Umayyads to the Abbasids to the Ottomans and was seen as an integral part of the Islamic faith. Umayyads and Abbasids, I'd like to learn about them. Umayyads to the Abbasids to the Ottomans, I was seen as an integral part of the Islamic faith and the understanding of the Ummah as a community of Muslims in the world. So I'm just saying, I'm guessing the Umayyad Caliphate is the caliphate that is most closely, is, is closest to when Muhammad was actually alive. I know Muhammad died before any caliphate was recognized. Either. And with one stroke of a pen, and as a community of Muslims in the world under a leader, and with one stroke of a pen and the presidential proclamation, Mustafa Kemal abolished it. Gone was a central element of the Islamic world and authority to all Muslims and their understanding of themselves as a group identity and part of a community that had existed for over a thousand years. The consequences of this decision were monumental. Mustafa Kemal had promised the Kurds to protect the Caliphate in the War of Independence, which resulted in the first split between the Kurds and the Turks. But the consequences were even larger beyond the Turkish Republic. It completely shattered a key element in how many people in the Muslim world saw and understood themselves. What are we now? Who are we? What is our tribe? Our identity, our community, are we still Muslims? Can Islam persist without the Caliphate? Are we nationalities? Are we Asians? Are we Africans? Are we Arabs? Are we Iranian? Are we races? Are we comrades? Are we a community? Can Jews or Christians be part of our community? Can I, I heard everything. Don't worry, I'm not, didn't have one of those ADD moments, but I, I did, but I heard. I love how much you can convey out of the shapes you draw eyes. Isn't that crazy? Are we comrades? Are we a community? Can Jews or Christians be part of our community? Can we live with Hindus? Are we kings? Are we Republicans? Are we back in the sixth century? What? Where? Who?
the Republicans. Are Sorry. We back? What does that mean? That looks so cool. The Saudi flag is one of my favorites. Probably top five. My top five favorite flags aesthetically. Nepal. Saudi Arabia. Spain. Kenya. North Macedonia. Back in the 6th century, what, where, who, how? Many, if not most of the problems throughout the Islamic countries in identity, politics, and nationality can be traced back to this fateful moment. From Gamal Abdel Nasser's proclamations of Arab nationalism, to Iran's Shah proclaiming himself to be a living god, to Jinnah founding a separate Muslim nation in India, to anti-Semitic programs in Iraq and Morocco, to the Saudis dragging their society back into the late Iron Age. On the 4th of April- I'm pausing a lot, but I don't care. Um, the, the Shah of Iran of Arab nationalism. Is it Nasser? He, all right. I don't, I, I always like, this is just like when I, when I talk about Justinian and the Byzantine empire, sometimes they call the Byzantine empire boring to me or Justinian to be a, uh, I don't like him. It, please. I know I'm not trying to tell everyone like, Hey, I'm an, I'm a historian. Listen to me. Uh, Justinian was awful and like I'm not saying that I don't know enough but from what I have watched on YouTube about Justinian I don't like him from what I have watched on YouTube about Nasser which is very little it's like two videos about the Suez crisis he seemed like a good guy now if there's stuff I don't know about that's gonna bite me I, then I'll change my mind to Iran's Shah proclaiming himself oh, yeah. to be a living uh, and the Shah of Iran so was the Shah of Iran sort of like the Tsar of Russia during the, uh, like, I, I find the, the fall of the Shah of Iran and the fall of the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas, Tsar Alexander, who was the last one who got killed, Anastasia, that whole story. I see that the last Tsar and the, the last Shah being very similar in that they seem to be almost not Iranian in terms of the Shah and almost not Russian in terms of the Tsar. They seem to be sort of heads of these places, but they seem to much more be in, in tied with foreign Western leaders than they are with their own populations. Let me know. God to Jinnah founding a separate Muslim nation in India, to anti-Semitic programs in Iraq and Morocco, to the Saudis dragging their society back into the late Iron Age. On the 4th of April 1996, when Mohammed Omar founded the Taliban, he broke open the chest of the cloak inside the shrine of the cloak. The Taliban? Oh my god. Imagine. Ugh. We're so much better. We destroyed them in Afghanistan. We showed them. <sighs> Touche. Taliban. You. You beat us. In Kandahar, Afghanistan, where Muhammad's cloak had been kept for centuries and wrapped himself in it, proclaimed before his followers that he was the legitimate representative of Muhammad, the caliph of all Muslims, leader of the new caliphate, and that the false gods of nationalism, democracy, and communism had failed. Events echoed when bin Laden proclaimed his war to restore the caliphate to the black flags recently flying over Iraq and Syria. It is still too early to say what the full consequences of Mustafa Kemal's decision were when he abolished an institution that he thought of as too backwards to be reformed and therefore had to be destroyed. Question making... again, do you guys think if the Gulf War, ne like because 9-11 was committed because of, I'm asking a question here, it was committed be because of foreign boots on Islamic soil or on, or because of foreign, you know, uh, what's it called if you're not Islamic? Infidel. Infidels, meaning like during the Gulf War. So like if the Gulf War never happened, the first Gulf War in the early 90s, would 9-11 have happened, I wonder? Mistake about the tremendous impact that this decision had throughout the world. But for Mustafa Kemal, that decision was just the starting shot. He followed it up by banning the fez, turbans, niqab, and burqa 
and the criminal penalty. The hijab was banned in public spaces such as schools and government buildings, and women who throughout most of the history of the Islamic world had been silent figures forced into the background by religion were told to come forward and be public beings and figures. This was followed by the closing of all Islamic schools. Keep in mind that at the time, all schools were Islamic schools, and the Sunni clergy held a monopoly on education. This was now over. I gotta find this out. It's driving me nuts, and I always forget. Sunni versus Shia. I need to find a way to, to memorize this. I learn it, and then I forget every time. After the death, I know, I know why they split, but I need to remember who is who. Where did, where did that go? Okay. Okay. So, Sunni, Shia, other body, Oman. Okay, so Iran is Shia. Saudi Arabia is Sunni. So, Sunni, Sunni, Sunni. So, Shia is the smaller one. So, Shia is... Red, which is just these few spots. Brown, orange, yellow. So red, brown, orange, and yellow. So orange. So Iran, like a little bit in Kyrgyzstan. Um, it seems like... Okay, so Iran, Azerbaijan. Some parts of Afghanistan. Some parts of Upper Pakistan. A good portion of southeastern Iraq and the western coat, the western edge of the uh, Persian Gulf, and then the red dots, and then everything else besides the Ibadi here is Sunni. So Shia, Iran, Shi Iran, Sunni, Shia, Shi Iran, Shiran. That's how I remember it. Shiran. Sunni. Shia. Okay. New schools were opened. The curriculum was entirely secular. Religion was scrapped entirely out of education. And education was compulsory and far more radical. It was also compulsory for girls who had previously, due to Islamic customs, been denied any and all education. This was followed by all women being granted and guaranteed legal equality before the law. And that was followed by the abolition of the Islamic calendar. It was no longer the year 1344, but the year 1925, as it was throughout the rest of the non-Muslim world. Next, he abolished Sharia law in its totality in each and every corner of the legal code, be it civil or criminal law. No more special taxes for non-Muslims. No more restrictions of freedoms. No more prohibition of alcohol. No more punishments for apostasy or other. You know, back in history, I would have think that a tax or non-Muslims, which was pretty liberal idea. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But yeah, nowadays, not so much. But I think before, even if even Christians, like a thousand, would kill you. So I, I think that in its heyday, that was pretty progressive. He introduced freedom of consciousness, making it possible for Muslims to convert to other faiths, or even openly leave their faith and be open atheists. Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Um, what's the Japanese one? Shintoism and what is that? Hinduism, Buddhism? Marriages between faiths and lack of faiths were now legal without a spouse being forced to convert as it would have been under Sharia. Mixed faith couples could now raise children together, which was forbidden under Sharia. The Islamic courts, Sharia Wait, justices, and the Sheikh al Islam, the highest religious legal authority in the land, were all abolished. He introduced a civil code of criminal and civil laws, shaped after examples set in Europe and North America, the first and so far only majority Muslim country to ever do so. Next, he banned the call to prayer. Was it? An okay comparison to compare this to the Protestant Reformation, loosely, to this. Is that okay? From minarets at mosques. Next, all imams became state bureaucrats on government payroll, under control by a secular government institution. What could and could not be preached during religious sermons had to be approved by the state. Preaching in Arabic was abolished and had to be conducted in the Turkish language. Next. Thank you guys for clarifying, clarifying that to me. It was a serious question. I really blanked. I wasn't sure if, if, if they spoke Arabic and Turkey or not. 
the Turkish alphabet was Latinized. The old Persian Arabic alphabet was replaced at all state and commercial institutions and schools. All adults who could read and write had to learn the new alphabet. All who couldn't read or write were taught to read and write with the new alphabet. All children would be raised with the new alphabet. Government advisors cautioned Mustafa Kemal to do this slowly and that it could only be done over the course of a decade. But Mustafa Kemal persisted and had this reform pushed through in five months. Next, all Turks had to take last names. Until then, people throughout the Islamic world had mostly only had one or two names. Erdogan. But there was no such thing as a last name or a family name. Mustafa Kemal changed that and took the last name Ataturk, which means the father of the Turks. He was the only one to take this name, and since he had no children, he would, in Turkish history, be the one and only father of the Turks. Next, Islam as the official religion of the state was cut out of the Republic's constitution. This was then followed by secularism being written into the constitution. That Everyone has the right to freedom of conscience, religious belief and conviction. Acts of worship, religious services and ceremonies shall be conducted freely, pro provided that they, do not that, that they do not violate the provisions of Article 14. No one shall be compelled to worship or to, or to participate in religious ceremonies and rites to reveal religious beliefs and convictions or be blamed or accused because of his religious beliefs and convictions. Blah, blah, blah. Defining the Turkish Republic as a state that separates religion and state. And there's a note to be made here. The Turkish word for secularism is laikik, which is a francophone, a French loan word in the Turkish language based on the French term laïcité. And that is important because French secularism isn't your average secularism. While most modern republics define the separation of religion and state as a freedom of religion, in which citizens are free to From worship, religion? believe and practice their faith, and even base their politics on their religious beliefs like as God. long as they don't force them upon others, French separation... Jeebish of religion and state, which is called laicity, is defined as freedom from, from religion, in that you, the citizen, are freed from religion by the state. It bans religious dress from all government and public institutions, be they parliament or school. It forbids any and all religiously inspired or dictated social policy, be they through private organizations or elected officials. This uniquely French interpretation of secularism, derived from the French revolutions and its thinkers like Auguste Comte, is controversial to this day, as it gives the French government the authority to restrict religious expression in public, such as banning the bikini and burqa under criminal penalty. It also gives the French authorities the power to restrict private religious programs and activities that the state determined to contravene the common good. For example, offering a pseudo-medical procedure known as gay conversion therapy in France is punished with a $60,000 fine and a two-year prison sentence. Laïcité is far more invasive and has a more hands-on approach to the separation of state and religion than in most other republics and democracies. And it is this type of separation of religion and state which Ataturk adopted for his new republic. Turkish society was torn down to then be rebuilt and modelled after the European states of the time. But Ataturk didn't just want to catch up with the modernity of his neighbours, he wanted to outdo them. But where could he? In what regard were Europe- The parallels to the Japanese is insane. European and American nations still lagging behind in progress. These were for most modern states technologically advanced with legal equality for all men. But mostly only for men. At the turn of the decade, women's equality movements had sprung into action as they had never before in human history. Okay. This is where Ataturk saw an opportunity to show off the progress of his new society to the outside world, and to even hint on how his new republic might soon overtake all the others. In the decades before, the Ottomans had made a point of showing off their princes to the outside world as symbols of the empire. Ataturk turned this on its head. He adopted several young girls who showed promise in education and accomplishments such as Afet Inan and Sabia Gökçen. Afet Inan became an accomplished anthropologist and historian. Sabia Gökçen became the world's first Air Force pilot and they both were presented throughout the world as symbols of progress within the Turkish Republic. Most countries represent themselves through national symbols, such as a national animal. Within this concept of national symbols, France is unique as it represents itself as a woman the famous Marianne leading the revolution, Ataturk decided that the symbol of Turkey was to be a modern, dark-haired Turkish woman leading the nation to progress. These were the images that Ataturk wanted the world to see. No longer 
Should Turkey be seen as this weird backward nation where veiled women are hidden behind closed doors, but a forward-thinking republic where a female president of a university and acclaimed historian can congratulate American women on receiving the right to vote and finally being the equals of their Turkish sisters? America one of Atatürk's biggest projects was his new capital. At first, there was confusion when he moved the capital from Istanbul to Ankara. Istanbul had been one of the world's most important metropolis for millennia. Ankara was comparatively nothing. A small town with a population of... I feel like that's usually the case. Like, the, the most prominent city in a country, I feel like, isn't usually... The capital, except, you know, I can think of London, Paris. I don't even know if you can say Berlin is that much larger than a lot of, you know, Munich, Frank than a lot of other big German cities. So I'm not even going to count Berlin. Uh, you do have Moscow, Rome. But anyways, like the U.S. is Washington, D.C. D.C. is not definitely not the biggest, not, isn't even the top two, maybe not even top three. Uh, Canada, it's, it's, uh, Udua, it's not Toronto. Um, well, Mexico is Mexico City. Brazil is Brazil. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Barely 30,000. But this was done for good reason. Compared to Istanbul, which had geographically been a central location in the larger empire, Ankara was geographically more central within the geography of the new republic. It was easier to access, had the only rail network leading into the south, and contained the headquarters of the army. But more importantly, the small size also served another purpose for Ataturk. He could build a new city for a new state in a new century. At a time when modernist architects were persecuted by fascist movements in Europe, Atatürk invited many of them, such as Bruno Taut, Clemens Holzmeister, and Paul Bonatz, to come into a Turkish exile and build a new capital with him. What they built was the futuristic Ankara that we know today. Detached from many concepts of traditional Middle Eastern style of buildings, a modern European metropolis was stamped out of the ground. If you visit the city today, you will find the symbols of another cultural revolution that took place here, manifested in architecture. Best symbolized with the Road of Lions, because these lions are imitations of 10,000-year-old Hittite bronze figurines. Adding to that, the coat of arms that Atatürk chose for his new city was a Hittite sun wheel, and the Road of Lions is also not far away from the newly built Turkish National Museum, filled with Hittite, Assyrian, Persian, Greek, Roman and nomadic artifacts. This might seem small to you from an outsider's perspective, but symbolized another monumental break from traditions and customs in Islamic societies. Before Ataturk, pre-Islamic cultures and relics were considered to be barbaric or even as sacrilegious or demonic by Islamic societies. In Arabia, ancient pre-Islamic castles and temples are being destroyed to this very day. Ataturk's new vision for his new state required the full Again, this is something that I'm not just picking on Islam here. This is something I'm sure Christianity did many centuries ago. I'm sure if they saw something non-Jesus or Christian, I'm sure they destroyed it. But man, how stupid do people have to be to think something is like go, heresy, destroy it. And um, there's nothing more infuriating than like those videos of, of ISIS um, like taking down ancient, like just blowing up ancient Babylon. That's infuriating and uh, so stupid, 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 imbecile, dumb, idiot. Forging of a new national Turkish identity, and that new identity, based on nationality, heritage, and language, made the ancient pre-Islamic civilizations part of that national identity. The Turks were to no longer just see themselves and identify themselves as just a part of a wider Islamic community, but to take pride in an identity with a wider historic legacy that included nomadic horsemen and ancient Anatolian civilizations. All of these reforms, the complete restructuring and reorganizing of a society in such a radical way like it had almost never been done before or since in human history, that was a great sentence, you know. 
seeing yourself just I love how that brought us back to the beginning of uh, the entire video new national Turkish identity and that new identity based on nationality heritage and language made the ancient pre-islamic civilizations part of that national identity the Turks were to no longer just see themselves and identify themselves as just a part of a wider Islamic community but to take pride in an identity with a wider historic legacy that included nomadic horsemen and ancient Anatolian civilizations I love that um I love it. All of these gives you a sense of pride as a Turk, I'm sure. Forms the complete restructuring and reorganizing of a society in such a radical way like it had almost never been done before or since in human history happened within 14 years, between 1923 and 1937. The goal behind them was to create a modern state shaped after a European Republic. But precisely the problem there is that republics are more often than not societies with a right to self-determination for the individual. Ask yourself this, is a society that forces you to not be religious any better than a society that forces you to be religious? No. You might find forced political religiosity and religious doctrine more contemptible than forced secularism, but a key component in both religious doctrine more be religious. You might find forced political religiosity and religious doctrine more contemptible than forced secularism. I, I think they're about equally bad. But a key component in both remains the force. A Ziyung's dictatorship is a term coined by the German historian Harald Neubert, who spent the final years of his academic career trying to figure out why the Soviet Union had failed. The word basically translates to educational dictatorship or the educating dictatorship. The idea is that the state was ruled by an ideological minority who found their legitimacy not through public approval but within their own beliefs and saw it as their role to rule as dictators until the public would finally be educated enough to see the validity of those beliefs and elect them through their own volition. However, in the Soviet Union, the dictator Sorry, I was going to go on a rant about communism, but I'm, I would have just sounded stupid. The dictatorial experience merely educated the people into rejecting that ideology. Ataturk's state was in many ways such an educational dictatorship. Ataturk saw himself as the first and last dictator of Turkey, the one dictator that the nation needed to educate it into never having another dictator again after him. The problem he had was putting this into effect. In 1925, he encouraged opposition figures to found a liberal opposition party with the intention of gradually democratizing society. However, seeing this as a weakness, disgruntled remnants of the young Turks attempted to assassinate him, and the Kurdish sheikh Said launched a rebellion to overthrow the republic, to reinstitute Sharia and re-establish the caliphate. The project of Turkish democracy was yeah, big problem with that. To found was putting this into effect. Is so he believes you know some you know kind of like a Caesar-like figure or or uh, who did he say? You know some communist leaders or whatever that that they think they need to. They're the person. To, who needs to be the dictator with all-encompassing power and uh, and set up a situation for for n no more totalitarian dictators after you and because you'll have set the foundation for them to go. But you, you can't do that in one life, um, which means it's almost impossible to do it all because... I, Right before you've solidified your reputation in your country as the dictator, and, and then now you're not a dictator, you're forming your opposition party while you're still alive. And so who's to say when you die, they don't take power and then it's all erased? In 1925, he encouraged opposition figures to assassinate him. And the Kurdish sheikh Said launched a rebellion to overthrow the republic, to reinstitute Sharia and reestablish the caliphate. The project of Turkish democracy was put on rest, and Ataturk responded with harsh measures, executing the remaining young Turk leaders and launching a heavy military crackdown against the Kurds. It was after this backlash that he somewhat backtracked his previously more radical positions. We believe that religion, which for every time this this voice talks, the I feel like 
the first instance, I feel like it's Barack Obama. And then I'm like, oh, it doesn't. The longest times has been used as a instrument of politics. politics. Must be liberated from politics to be elevated. We cannot abuse our holy faiths as instruments of politics. Inevitable. It is unclear how sincere he may have been when making this statement. Ataturk himself had stopped practicing Islam in 1923. But besides the conflict with the religious population, the Kurdish uprising of 1925 also exposed other problems with the new vision of the Turkish national identity. The fact that it was built on a new nationalist identity formed exclusively around the Turkish language, heritage and culture. It left no room for Kurds, thereby sowing the seeds for inevitable future conflicts. It was an idea that left no room for any cultural, lingual and to some extent even political aberrations. However, the pluralism that Ataturk wished for this society to achieve requires such aberrations and diversity to exist. To ensure that his vision for the future after him would be safe, Ataturk established a National Security Council, an institution of generals that had the expressed permission to intervene in the politics of the country by force if the constitution of the secular republic was ever under threat of being undermined. A role usually given to civil opposition and the Supreme Court was thereby handed to the army. Gar Guys, it is so difficult. To start a nation like this and it makes me so thankful that they were smart people at the beginning of uh the u.s to create somewhat of a successful government structure because man is it difficult guaranteeing even more future conflict potential the cracks in all of this would show at some point decades later it would be revealed that sabir gökçen the war hero a national symbol of turkish social progress was actually an armenian a genocide survivor adopted from an orphanage by Ataturk. The diversity in this society was still there, it was just hidden behind the scenes. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk died on the 10th of November 1938 at 5 past 9 in the morning. It is an easy historic date and time to remember, because every year on the 10th of November at 5 past 9 in the morning, the sirens go off in all Turkish cities and towns and everyone stops in their tracks for a minute of silence. For outsiders, it all might seem somewhat weird to observe, almost like a personality cult in a dictatorship. But this is really not the case. Ataturk is genuinely revered by the Turkish people, who to this day see him as the savior of their nation and the founder of their modern society. To this day- Like a, like a George Washington is to us sort of thing, or maybe even more significant? They go to his memorial in Ankara in the millions to pay their respects. Years ago, when I first looked into this topic and had a conversation with a Turkish friend, I commented on how weird it was to me that wow. Mustafa Kemal called himself the father of the Turks and was abruptly interrupted by a No, we call him the father of the Turks. As we go forward into the story of the Republic, you will find that Ataturk's shadow dominates over this state and its people throughout their journey through the 20th century. No other political figure would have as much of an impact on this country as he did until 2003. Awesome. Um, that was fantastic. I, I finished through it and it only got better as it went on. And um, really great. Kraut, right? Great channel. It took me a while, guys, but I did do it, and I'm happy I did. That was very enjoyable, and I learned a lot, and it's important to learn. It, what I love about learning a lot about a, a place like Turkey is that it, it's in such an area in the world geographically located that when you learn about its entire history, you get peeks into so many other people, other nations' history because... They're, they are where they are, and they're going to come in contact with so many other areas. Really awesome. Um, yeah, um, again, all I know about the man is from this video. Uh, he seemed to be a very important, uh, obviously he, was, he is a very important person to the Turkish history, and was an amazing person. One of those kind of people who don't come around very often. Nation builders. Cool video, guys. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Better, you know, I'm feeling a bit better. 
um, myself after getting that second strike. I'm thinking about moving stuff over to my second channel um, for the time being until the strikes wear off my main one. And so I'm not exactly sure. I think this is what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to download every one of the parts of the Turkish Century that I did over the months and take all of them and upload them all at once on my second channel in an effort to to move stuff over there to avoid uh, losing the, the entire thing. Awesome video, guys. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you can answer my questions or if you learned something or enjoyed it as much as I did. Hope you did. See you next time, guys. If you're not doing well, you will soon. Don't worry, my friend. Chin up. Emotions are fickle. Bye.